Samsung is getting a lot of press lately, both good and bad. And while everyone on YouTube is fighting over their new OLED, it's their top of the line QLED that I was most curious about. Because last year we bought the previous model twice, only to return them because of major issues with the backlighting, the kind where you could literally see the mini LEDs through the screen, which is not ideal. So is the third time gonna be the charm? Well, let's see if Samsung's new 8K flagship, the QN900B, is any better. The 900B is a native 8K display. This is important because 8K is four times the resolution of 4K. Crazier still, it takes the equivalent of 16 HD displays to equal a single 8K one. Now the 900B relies on some pretty hefty processing in order to keep HD and 4K signals looking their very best. Samsung's neural quantum processor 8K uses a form of AI to upscale lesser signals to 8K in order to give you the best, sharpest, and most accurate image possible. Beyond pixels and processing, the Samsung uses mini LED backlighting as well as quantum dot technology for insane brightness and OLED light contrast. Samsung being Samsung does not support Dolby Vision, but it does have support for HDR, HDR10 plus adaptive and gaming, as well as HLG. It has a native refresh rate of 120 hertz and will support refresh rates up to 144 hertz when fed a 4K 144 signal. There's also support for FreeSync Premium and ALLM. While the TV may not support Dolby Vision, it does have support for Dolby Atmos and can send an Atmos signal to connected devices like a soundbar or receiver via its ARC eARC enabled HDMI port. Oh, and all four HDMI ports are spec 2.1. For a full breakdown of everything this TV can do, check out the links in the description. Now the Samsung is a slim display, maybe not OLED level slender, but for a TV utilizing LED backlighting, albeit mini LED, it's narrow. It manages this by having all of its inputs and outputs, processors and power supplies located in a detachable box that Samsung calls the One Connect box. Now, if you opt to mount this TV on the wall, know that the Samsung cable is very fragile and may require professional assistance in order to run it through a wall safely. Now we tested the 900B using a Sony P PS5, Xbox Series X, as well as our Apple TV 4K. And we connected all of these using high-speed HDMI cables capable of supporting 8K resolutions. And for sound, we relied on the KEF LS60 wireless towers and our Samsung Q950A soundbar, the latter allowing us to test Samsung's Q-Symphony tech for movies, television, and gaming. Now out of the box, the Samsung is two things, bright and colorful to almost an obnoxious degree. I measured upwards of 1800 nits of brightness out of the box, though the brightest profiles, vivid and standard, weren't exactly calibrated from the factory. If one were so inclined, I am confident the Samsung could easily crest 2000 nits of brightness with the right settings. Unsurprisingly, the movie and filmmaker profiles proved to be more accurate, both in terms of grayscale and color, nearly meeting the standard for calibrated from the factory. They were notably less bright, making the image more pleasing and easier on the eyes. Following a full calibration, the Delta E for both grayscale and color measured less than one, which puts the Samsung up there as one of the best TVs we have ever had on this channel. But the QN900B has a trick up its sleeve auto calibration. Using a compatible smartphone, I use Christie's iPhone 12 Pro and the Samsung SmartThings app, you can calibrate the 900 to perfection. At least that's the promise. Well, knock me over with a feather because it f worked. It even bested my manual calibration a bit with an average margin of error or Delta E of roughly 0.5. So that's no special calibration tools or training required. That said, Samsung still sets the brightness a little high post auto calibration, though I doubt many viewers will mind. With the SAMI dialed in, I ran a few tests aimed at exposing weaknesses in its backlighting control, contrast, and sharpness, and of course, test its motion errors. Be it SD, HD, or 4K, the Samsung displayed everything I threw at it with flying colors. This TV has some impressive local dimming, second only to our LG C2 OLED, with almost zero blooming from the LED back display. And speaking of OLED, the Samsung has OLED grade black levels and contrast, at least in our tests. The presence of real natural contrast in both dark and light scenes got me thinking that maybe, just maybe, Samsung has cracked mini LED in 2022. Throw in dead nuts accurate color rendering and you can see clear as day why this is Samsung's flagship display.
Now getting back to this TV's brightness, standard dynamic range content like Titanic or Yellowstone just popped with HDR-like vibrancy. Skin tones, texture, detail, and color fidelity are all top notch. And while I think Christie will say that the Sony image ultimately looks just a little bit more realistic, this is likely due to our Sony X95J just not being able to keep pace with the Samsung's overall brightness, resulting in an image that simply doesn't pop quite to the same degree as the 8K Samsung. Now feed this TV an HDR signal like Stranger Things Season 4 and be prepared to be amazed, though don't be surprised if if you ultimately end up dialing back the brightness or tone mapping just a bit. For even in the face of an HDR signal, the Samsung can be a tad hot. For example, the scene where Max first tangles with Vecna in the upside down. The lightning strikes and flashes of light could cause the specular highlights on both Max and Vecna's face to clip or posterize. At first I thought this was just an error made by the filmmakers, but upon dialing down the brightness or adjusting the TV's tone mapping, it was clear that the Samsung was just too bright in HDR mode, even after their auto calibration. But aside from that minor and ultimately fixable quibble, there's just absolutely nothing objectionable about the Samsung's picture quality. Hell, even scaling lowly HD signals up to 8K looked brilliant, as evident in my repeat viewing of Titanic. Plus, one of the things I really like about 8K is the fact that the pixel density of these displays is so jam-packed. Compression artifacts get a little reduction or disguised as film noise. I'm not saying that the Samsung's image is noisy, but in the face of an older HD film transfer, it was the 8K upscaling that made Titanic one of my favorite viewing experiences during our review period. Now switching gears to sound for just a second, the QN900B's internal speakers don't outright suck. They're not going to replace any decent soundbar or dedicated speaker system, but I found them intelligible and useful enough. That said, adding the Samsung Q950A soundbar was an awesome experience. Watching Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness with the Q Symphony engaged was impressive. While I personally didn't care for the film, the Samsung sound was immersive and cinematic AF. Does the Q Symphony tech work? Hell yes it does, and I absolutely love it. And as for gaming, the Samsung touts itself as a gamer's television, and for good reason. Okay, 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 okay. Hold on. I need to take over for a second because he... He just said that this was a gaming TV? I couldn't resist. I had to go down and see for myself as someone who is passionate about games. And there's three things with gaming that are very, very important. One is brightness. I can't tell you how many TVs or monitors I've come across where I had to up the brightness the second I opened it. This was the first time I actually had to turn down the brightness, which is a great problem to have. Number two. 4K at 120. 4K at 120 is a huge deal. And I thought it was too good to be true, but sure enough, that 4K looked crispier than your favorite salty snack, and that 120 frames was buttery, buttery smooth. And number three, which is the worst part about a big TV, is input lag. But guess what? I didn't really find any input lag. And I couldn't believe it to the point where I was literally walking up to the screen going like this just to see if it was off, but it wasn't. As someone who loves gaming, I can confidently say this is the best TV for gaming that I have ever seen. From a gamer to a gamer, I approve. Now back to Andrew. The only remaining question is, does one really need 8K in 2022? Short answer, no. The only group of people who will likely be able to take full advantage of a TV like this are gamers, more specifically PC gamers, as both the Xbox and PlayStation have not yet turned on their 8K capability as of this review. For the typical moviegoer, is 8K a must-have? No. But when discussing screen sizes in excess of 75 inches, I wouldn't shy away from 8K because an 8K TV makes for an arguably better 4K experience when wanting to go big. In terms of image quality, especially after carrying out Samsung's auto calibration, there is little that I can find fault with. This is just an incredible display for all types of viewing, and the upscaling is among the best that I have seen, and 100% on par with what Sony is doing with their cognitive processing, at least based on what we've seen with our X95J. I still don't care for Samsung's built-in OS and menu structure. They're needlessly complicated for something Samsung has 
clearly attempted to make simple and easy. Simple tasks take multiple steps to complete, and as a result, things like switching inputs, making image adjustments, and whatnot, they can become tedious fast. Also, for a TV this expensive, why in the hell is there bloatware? I get why you find bloatware on a sub thousand dollar TV, but on a TV that costs upwards of six grand, unacceptable. Lastly, this TV gets warm. Stand within about a foot of it and you can feel it. In the summer months, the Samsung will no doubt raise the ambient temperature of whatever room it's in. In terms of comparisons, we put it up against LG's C2 OLED that we just got our hands on. And I don't wanna spoil the LG review, so let me just say this. If you don't like to tinker and you're looking for a top flight TV that is easier to set up and live with straight away, the Samsung is that TV. If you've been on the fence about OLED versus QLED, specifically the QN900B, you owe it to yourself to see these two side by side because the days of OLED's absolute superiority over LED in terms of image fidelity, contrast, and black level rendering, I think are over. Not saying that the LG is bad, but it may not be the automatic winner like it has been in the past. Compared to our now updated Sony X95J, I have to say this one is tough. If I could merge these two TVs into one, I would, and I would be a very happy camper in the process. I still love our Sony blooming issues and all, but I love the brighter, more accurate image of the Samsung too. I think Sony's cognitive processing, especially with respect to motion and how it identifies and renders human subjects, may be just a hair better than the Samsung, but when it comes to HDR viewing, the Sony simply cannot compete with what the QN900B can dish out, even if the SAMI lacks Dolby Vision support. The Samsung is the better TV, but how it compares to Sony's 2022 lineup remains to be seen because Digital Trans is currently bogarting the Sony review sample we're waiting on. What more is there to say? The Samsung QN900B is the brand's flagship display for a reason. Because in all my years of reviewing TVs, few have managed to impress me as much as it has. Had Samsung sent us the 85-inch model for review, I would have already destroyed the box and handed over my credit card info. But because they didn't, I now have a decision to make over which of the next three or four TVs will end up being our new reference. Needless to say, all will have a hard time living up to the standard Samsung has set here because this TV is damn good. So that's it. That is now my review of Samsung's flagship 8K display, but now I'm curious what Christy thought of it. It's bright as f y'all. <laughs> I mean, pull out your sunglasses. You're going to need them. <laughs> Oh God. I mean, thank God they solved the horrendous backlighting issues in last year's models. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how they sent any of those out the door, but seeing as they discontinued that model, not even like a year, it wasn't even a full year. It yeah. Was they what? updated it after about like 10 months. If that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think Samsung knew damn well that TV was a mess, mm -hmm. uh, but seriously, this TV is very, very good. Yeah. To me, it reminds me a little bit more of the Sony Master Series OLED than mm. I think any other TV mm -hmm. we've seen. The black levels are insanely good. Yeah. And like you said, it's it's practically three dimensional. Mm -hmm. The colors, I think that you're either you're either gonna love them or you don't. Okay. Like I still prefer Sony's color science, which as a Nikon shooter, mm -hmm. I can't even believe that I would even say that because I thought you know if you're looking at camera. Color science, Sony, it's just ugh, gross. Um, but they, they do know what they're doing with the TVs. To me, it's a more natural looking picture, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about skin tones. Would you know, it's all about the skin tones for me. Yeah. Sony has them all beat. Mm -hmm. But if you like that orange and teal vibe, then I think you're going to love the Samsung. Well, I mean, I don't know. I just prefer my skin tones to have a little bit more pink in them, which is why I'm holding out that Sony will actually send us a damn TV this year. <laughs> but you know what, Sony? Just keep waiting and watch yourself get replaced. Yeah. I, I have to say, you, and you and I have, have argued about color science and, and all of that We've for as long as we've known each other. Oh, yeah. For as long as we've known each other. Because... I come from the land of, while yes, there is such a thing as color science, there are such things as standards. And the difference that I believe that you're seeing uh, <laughs> uh, has nothing to do at all with one TV being better with respect to color than the next. It has everything to do with color luminosity. 
and that is the fact that the Samsung is clearly brighter. And as a result, that brightness has an effect on the luminosity of colors. It's not that the Samsung is teal and orange or is, un is not accurate with respect to its colors. It's actually more accurate than the Sony. But because the Sony simply, at least our X95J, this is only about last year's models. I cannot speak to the new models. But as it relates to the X95J, because the Sony simply cannot put the brightness down the way the Samsung does, you are not forced with having to make a decision as far as do you want brighter colors or do you want textbook accurate colors with respect to luminosity. The Sony can do exactly what is required of it within a specific color space. The Samsung, in terms of luminosity, can actually exceed standards. And so then it comes down to personal choice. And like I say in the video, even post calibration, where the colors and contrast and all that are pretty much bang on, Samsung, kind of like what they're doing with their um, OLEDs, as I understand it, still juice brightness because clearly they understand that that is something that viewers respond to. If I were to take the brightness of the Samsung down so that it was knit for knit the same as the Sony, I don't believe that you would feel as strongly as you do. But I didn't do that because it was very nice to have and be able to enjoy a TV like the Samsung that has the capability of being just a little bit brighter. I hear you. I still think the Sony colors are better. <laughs> I don't give a damn about the measurements. <laughs> um, okay, but fair enough. Fair I, enough. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to absolutely lose their mind over the Samsung television mm -hmm. because it is so bright. Mm -hmm. And the blacks are so black and it's like, it, to me, it looks like an OLED. Yeah. If I, if you were to pop this TV in front of me and I didn't know what the model or make of it was or whatever, I would say, Oh, this has got to, this is an OLED. Mm -hmm. There'd be no reason that I wouldn't think that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um, now, as far as whether or not you are into the super bright, bright look, I mean, I think that this is one of the first times where I'm like, Oh, you know, I just don't know if this bright is for me right it's it's almost like being in the store when they have like that st what do they call it like the store retail setting retail mode the yeah. retail modes yeah and you it's know, on which, vivid and everything's yeah i mean it's not well everything looks just so artificial in in that in those modes but mm -hmm. this is close to that and I, again i think it's just going to come down to a personal preference and for me, it was a little bit aggressive on my eyes at mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. especially when watching just like regular TV. Yeah. You know, I'm not talking about Stranger Things where they clearly had like one candle to light the entire set <laughs> yeah, all and, season. And guys, uh, <laughs> and some of you are going to leave comments saying like, I can watch Stranger Things. It's not a big deal. I see everything. You're watching an SD. Or standard definition. Yeah, because we had to turn, we had to, there's a new Amazon show with Chris Pratt. And we started watching that in HDR. And we had to turn the HDR off because the first 20 minutes of that show, even on a capable set like the LG OLED, uh, was dim as shit. Yeah, you couldn't see you it. You couldn't see it. I mean, it's a terrible show anyway. We stopped watching yeah. it. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really difficult with some of these new, the newer programming, newer TVs or sorry, TV shows, movies, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Like there just is this trend towards shooting everything in a, I guess, ambient light yeah. situation. Yeah. Um, but even then it's. <sighs> Which is annoying. I think everyone's doing their best Roger Deakins impression because um, he's very much the master of the natural look, although he lights his scenes to the bejesus. If there's any DPs watching this. He's not just rocking a high sensitivity sensor and going outside. He uses more <laughs> lights than f anybody. Um, but that said, he has a very natural look. And I think that there's a whole, a whole just slew of hot new DPs hitting the, the film scene. And they think that because these sensors see in the dark, and I'm looking at you, Sony, um, that you don't have to light anything. And it's freaking annoying. 
It's freaking annoying. I can't stand it. Okay. So anyway, moving on moving. from <laughs> the, you know, dissertation over whether or not modern filmmakers know what they're doing. Um, one of the more surprising aspects of this television, as you pointed out in the video, was the gaming mm -hmm. um, functions. You know, your brother Josh came down and he is basically a professional gamer. Yeah. Okay. Like he's. He's ranked. He's ranked. On, he's, certain, on certain games. He's he's very good. And like he could take a game, you know, and play it in a matter of like minutes, whereas it would take Andrew, you know, weeks. Yeah. Um. And I know he was really imp impressed. Mm -hmm. I think that he said he would probably go with like a 55 or 65 inch right. display. Yeah. He would want this TV, but in the slightly smaller size. Because something about being too big, too big was, yeah. can't, I, I can't remember like what he, he said. said. Like, like I said, you can't, he couldn't track all of the, all of the fast action happening at the fringes because it was, you know, so much to take in but in terms of motion like he was whip panning around and there was like i mean it was buttery smooth and i i mean i know that i've said things are buttery smooth before but he was playing um overwatch at 4k 120 or it might have been 4k 144 even and that was just like there was no smearing no tearing nothing you didn't see any of that with this no. tv no no it was it was really impressive I'm a big proponent of 8K, but I'm not a big proponent of 8K because I think that um, 8K content is right around the corner. I think 8K content is closer than people think, but that is not the reason I would invest in 8K. I like 8K for the pixel density. I like that everything gets reduced to just film grain. And to me, that is its biggest strength. The best 4K TV on the market is an 8K one in my opinion. And when we know that you and I, we're always shopping for TVs that are 85 inches and larger, 8K makes a lot of sense from that perspective, even if there isn't any content, but it does get very expensive. Expensive. Yeah. So anything else? No, I think we've covered it. All right. Well, that is now our take on Samsung's flagship QN900B 8K QLED TV. What did you guys think? Let us know down in the comments below. Uh, my question of the day for you is this one. I'm going to pull this one just out of thin air. With all of the hype around Samsung's OLED, whether you think that they're playing games with consumers or not, do you think their QLED TVs are being overlooked? Because I think. Uh, let us know. I am curious. Uh, if you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. Go ahead and ring that bell so that you're notified when new videos come out. If you use any of the links that Christy left for you down below, or you left us a thanks, or you become a member, all three of these uh, things uh, show your support for the channel and the work that we do here. And both of us, thank you very much for doing that. Follow me on Instagram at Recovering Audiophile, and that is it for us today. Uh, thank you. Shout out to Joystick Gamer, Josh, for coming in and helping us to test this truly, truly awesome TV. Uh, if you're not already subscribed to him, uh, go ahead, go give him a shout out. Say you saw him on the channel. Uh, subscribe, like, leave him a comment, but just thank him for helping us to test this TV. And that is it for us today. So remember, the only person who has to like the sound or sight of your system is you. It's happy listening, happy watching. We'll see you on the next video, right? Have a good one.